Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope this Bible study led by Pastor Alan Brooks encourages you in living the new life Jesus is offering you. If you're joining us today, um, this is a special day for us for a couple of reasons. One, because it's the house of the Lord and we're gathered as His family together. Welcome. Uh, second of all, today is when we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, and it is also what we call the encounter. The encounter for us is acknowledging that we serve and we worship a living God. And it is our hope and prayer today that you would encounter Him in this service. So it's a little bit different kind of a service. We do a team teaching on these Sundays in addition to taking communion as well. But uh, Pastor Leonard and I are going to talk about something I think very important today. We're going to engage a question that we've actually been talking about among our leadership recently, and that is, why do we exist? Not like us personally, why do I exist or why do you exist, but why do we, the church, why do we exist? Now, I think we all get that the building here, although we often call it our church, is this the real church, biblical church, right? No, we, those of us who are brothers and sisters in faith, we are the church. And so, an important question, why do we, the church, exist? Now, Leonard, I know you have, just like I have, heard a lot of different reasons why people think we exist, but I mean, what are some things that you've heard about that? As um, many of you guys know, when, as he said, that uh, it's not the building, it's us uh, collectively. It's like, uh, how many of you went to a foreign country, somewhere else, that you meet another believer and automatically connect with them. It's, that's the body of Christ. We have something in common automatically, and that's what's great about that. But some things that I've ho- heard over the years is we have our own job. We're like uh, put into this category of you are to take care of the poor, feed the poor, take care of widows and orphans, and uh, to convict, to change lives. Those are those that are in prison, yeah. mm-hmm. those that are sick. But uh, how do we as people change lives? Hmm, Just a pretty profound question if we're looking at ourselves. But Alan, this morning, do we even need to come to church or can we just talk to God? I I guess it depends on who you talk to. Yeah. Well, let's look together at our passage and see what the Lord reveals through Scripture. That's the best place to get answers and where there's truth. If you guys have your Bibles this morning, I would ask you to turn to John 5. Uh, Whatever, if you don't have your Bibles, your tablet, your phone, whatever it is. You know, I I remember someone saying back time, the rustling of the the, uh, books of the Bible would make the uh, devil uneasy. So I don't know if the clicking and all that (laughs) stuff. Not quite the same, is it? It's kind of weird, but. It's also in in our app. For those of you that have our app, you can turn to today's uh, message and all the passages will be in there for you as well. We'll be in John chapter 5, starting in verse 31. And this is Jesus talking right here. And he, he begins to say, if we were to testify on, if I were to testify on my own behalf, my testo- testimony would not be valid, but someone else also testifying about me is testifying about me. And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist and his testimony about me was true. Now, as we always should, whenever we look at a passage of Scripture, we want to look at its context. And if you back up a little bit further in this passage, you'll see that Jesus has got this ongoing dialogue with the religious leaders. It starts in part because Jesus isn't honoring the Sabbath rules. Now, let me explain that for a second. What the Jews did is they had the law that was given by Moses, but the Jews, the leadership felt like they needed to help explain what God meant. And so they added all of these oral traditions and oral commandments on top of the written commandments. And it was those that Jesus wasn't honoring. Jesus, for example, would heal someone intentionally on the Sabbath, which really made the religious leaders mad because that was a violation not of one of God's rules, but one of their own rules. In addition, in responding to them one time, he made it clear that he and the Father were one which aggravated him even worse, that here Jesus would make himself equal with God. As far as they were concerned, that was blasphemy. And of course, if it wasn't true, it would be. 
But one of the things that I love about this, and hopefully it's profound to you as well, is that Jesus wasn't self-validating. He wasn't saying, okay, I'm the son of God, so what I have to say goes. He actually relied on other witnesses, which is in fulfillment of what God said in his written law. In our Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, it says you need two or three witnesses to make a case. And that's exactly what Jesus did. To make his case that he is the Son of God, the promised Messiah, he had multiple witnesses. And one of those first witnesses that we're hearing about here this morning is John the Baptist. Now, it's curious, for those of you especially that know, know your Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, you know that John was foretold about this forerunner to the Messiah by at least a couple of different prophets, the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Malachi. And so here is this witness that's already out there talking up about who the Savior is and what he's come to do. Now notice that Jesus says that everything that John said about him is true. Now, what were some of the things that John the Baptist was saying about Jesus? You know, that this came at a, at a pretty crazy time, as you mentioned the prophet Malachi, because there hadn't been one since Malachi, so you see John come on the scene. It's almost 400, 400 plus years, yeah. Yes, some, something like that. And here this person out of the Judean desert comes uh, with his first words of repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's like, what, who's this guy talking on the scene? But some of the things that I've heard proclaim or actually look to scripture to see is uh, straight out of John 1, 29 and 30, where he says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That would be enough for me right there. <laughs> but he goes on to say, he is the one I was talk about, talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he has existed long before me. So note the irony in what he just said. Even John the Baptist was saying something about Jesus that indicated that he had to be of an origin outside of the human domain, right? What we would call the Son of God. Yeah. You know what gets me about that whole thing is Jesus was born after him. So here he's saying he existed long before me, and it was only a fraction of months, you know what I mean? In, in physical time. In physical time. Right. But yet you get to see God right there. Get to see that. What a full picture we get to see of who Jesus truly is. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was great about John the Baptist, as a reminder for those of you that know it and for those of you that don't know it, he made it very clear that he was not the Messiah. That he was not even fit to be the Messiah's slave. You know, to, to tie his sandals, you know, John said. I'm not even fit, you know, worthy enough, you know, to do that. If we go back to our passage here in John 5 and verse 34... Jesus goes on to say, of course, I have no need of human witnesses, but I say these things so that you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message, but I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified about me himself. Don't miss what he says next. You have heard his voice, or excuse me, you have never heard his voice or seen him face to face. What's the insinuation Jesus is making? You've never heard his voice or seen him face to face, but I have. And he goes on to say, and you don't have the message, his message in your hearts because you don't believe me. That's proof right there. The one he sent to you. You know, as I see that, <clears throat> he didn't need to prove himself. You know, but he did all these miracles that testified of who he was. Nobody was healing the sick and the lame and all that thing at that time. Even back to what he said, so that we would be saved. So yeah. that those who were hearing him would be saved. It, they got to see a picture of who the true, in fact, living God was through these miracles. On people that had been lame forever and all of a sudden get up and walk that was something to see i'm sure even would be something for us to see today 
you know, if we look at John 14, 6, it, it's, it's just like one of those verses that everyone usually knows. Mm -hmm. Jesus told him and said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know my fa who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Wow, that's, that just throws them for a loop, I'm sure, at the time. Well, again, I, th I think even in culture today, people are saying, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, really? Have you read the Bible? Because mm. <laughs> he claimed to be God a lot. Yes, yes. You know, and you're going back to that scripture there is, uh, John was a burning lamp. He was showing this light of what there was. But here, the true light, the, the light bulb, I would say, Christ himself is showing the light, and he comes on the scene. You know, they liked what they were seeing. They got baptized, in it, but something happened. There was a shift that yeah. happened, and it became difficult. And I think how is there had to be change in their lives. It involved something that they had to change. They couldn't live the way they used to. It's even my own life, as I would call the BC days before Christ. I couldn't continue to live out them days as I lived for Christ. There had to be a change, a change that only would come from him. And as they seen the miracles happening right before them, uh, it still was difficult for them. Mm -hmm. I, I think what you said is very important, and we don't want to miss this, is that the change that any of us have experienced in Christ, that wasn't something that we made happen, was it? That's something that Jesus made happen. And that's why he, people knowing Jesus is so incredibly important. We really can't, I can't even change myself, right? And uh, it, it, it goes back to that thing is all of those things. When you come to Jesus, it's like, hey, Alan, I, I, I'd like to do that, but I need to change my life first. Mm -hmm. It's the other way around. Give yourself to Christ. He will make the difference. He'll right. make the changes that are the correct changes because who knows what we would bring to the table. Yeah. But, you, you know, when you and I first believe, remember when you came to that point of knowing Jesus, how excited and how lit up you were, you wanted to tell people in restaurants, wherever you came in contact with, they said, wow, that guy's a holy roller. And I'm like, with grease on the wheels, you know, <laughs> I'm ready to go. But maybe it's not become so popular now as what happened there because it has become difficult. There's many of us that have come across those difficulties in our life where it seems like it's hard. We too have seen miracles all throughout this place of Jesus doing things in our own lives and have trouble still believing. Uh, you know, we all want answers, but usually what we're looking for is specific answers. I wish there was a perfect thing saying, Leonard, this is what I need you to do. Mm -hmm. And people were certain, searching through scriptures that we continue on to see that. So continuing on in, in verse 39 of John, Jesus again speaking, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to receive the life, this life. Your approval means nothing to me because I know you have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you get gladly welcome them. No, no wonder you can't believe. For you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Yet it isn't I who accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, in whom you put your hopes. If you really believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? Wow, don't miss the first part of what was read there. They searched the scriptures. Now, to be clear, none of the New Testament as we know it exists yet. The Bible as we know it really doesn't exist yet. So these scriptures that they searched were what? Scrolls. They were the scrolls of the Hebrew scriptures, often referred to as the law and the prophets. Now we in the Christian Bible have them divided out in 39 different books, but it's those Hebrew scriptures, the law and the prophets that they were searching. But more importantly, notice why it is they were searching the scriptures. They thought they were the key to eternal life. Now, here's the irony with this. You know, you've heard that phrase, they couldn't see the forest for the tree, right, or the trees. 
I was thinking about that this week relative to these things called stereograms. I've got one up here on the screen as an example. Now, when I look at that thing, all I can really see is rocks. And I, I've tried and tried to see what's revealed beyond the picture. Does anybody, by the way, know, see it? Wow, nobody at the first service could identify it either. I thought I wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> But apparently there is a vision here of the resurrection of Jesus within this picture. But to the point, I was reading up about these stereograms, and somebody wrote, many can see them right away without any training. Some cannot see them at all, no matter what they try. Most of us simply need to train our eyes to see. So going back to those who were searching the Scriptures... They were so hung up on the words that they missed the message. Do you see how ironic it is? They searched those scriptures so that what? So that they would have eternal life. Yet the very person, the very message of eternal life is where? Standing right in front of their eyes. And they can't even see him. That happens still today, doesn't it? I've known people that knew the Bible better than I did, but didn't understand the message. They totally missed Jesus. And the point here is that all of these scriptures, even our newer scriptures, what we call the New Testament, they all point to the same message. And he has a name. And his name, of course, is? Jesus, right? They're all pointing to him. And that's what his point is. In fact, I I was really struck by this phrase this week. I have to tell you, I don't know that I had really noticed it before. I'm sure it was there before this week. But Jesus said, your approval means nothing to me. What's he saying? He's saying, you've had more than enough witnesses to who I am. John has foretold who I am. The scriptures foretold who I am. My miracles, my teachings make it abundantly clear who I am. In fact, he goes on to say, you've honored others who've come in their own name, probably because they came with the same ideas and message that the people who received them believed. But his point is, I came, not in my own name, but in the Father's name. And they rejected him. Where they honored the others, they despised Jesus. Tremendously ironic if you think about it. So Leonard, we've talked a little bit about how some of us, like with a stereogram, can train our eyes to see. How is it that maybe we need to better train our eyes to see why the church exists? You know, if if we backed up just a little bit into that thing, if we opened our eyes just in the morning and see the beauty, the birds singing, we would see God's glory right there. We would got to see Jesus. We mm-hmm. get to see all of this. But why do we exist? Have you ever asked that question? Why you're even here this morning? Why do you even come to church? Do we even need to? As we yeah, said we, on the front end, uh, on the front end, do we even need to? Or can we just talk to God? You know, the church exists is to know Jesus and to make Him known. It. it, it we need to know that if if. If I didn't know Jesus, if somebody didn't approach me and tell me about Jesus, you and I wouldn't be, wouldn't be here. Absolutely. So that's a pass on of what that is. It's to know Jesus and make him known. Yeah, the reason that we gather on Sundays, the reason many of us gather in groups at home is so that we would better know Jesus. But it doesn't just stop there because it isn't just about us. Then we seek to go out and make the world known. And one of the ways we make the world know Jesus is through these other things we do, like feeding the poor, doing the various things of visitation in hospitals and prisons and that sort of thing. But it's because we want Jesus to be known. Jesus' miracles, when he healed people, it was so that he would be known. And so people go, wow, Jesus is a big deal. Maybe I need to know more about him. You know, we, we all want purpose in our lives. We all want to know what that purpose is. We serve no purpose if we're not serving Jesus. We have no breath in our lungs as we sung earlier mm-hmm. because we're defeated of our enemy. And it's only Jesus that gives true life. And why, why not share that with someone else? 
It, it's giving you that prescription and you leaving it on that table and it doesn't do nothing for you because you didn't use it. Yeah, didn't take it. That's the prescription that changed my life was Jesus Christ. And that's for us to share as well, that portion. Mm -hmm. It's all about Jesus, nothing else. But to know Jesus sounds real good, but how do we do that practically? Well, let's be clear here this morning that that's where it all starts. It starts on an individual basis, as it did with Leonard, as it did with me, as it did for many of you, and us choosing to believe the witnesses. We looked to the scriptures and said, okay, I believe this is what it claims about itself, that it was inspired by God. It's there to tell me what is right and to tell me what is wrong. Otherwise, we could just make up right and wrong for ourselves, right? But when we believe that this is the very living message and word of God, that changes things a lot for us. And so it starts with us believing not only that human witness and those witnesses that talk to us about Jesus, but the very divine and supernatural witness of God himself. You know, there are people that read about the miracles of Jesus, how he gave sight to the blind and raised the dead, and people scoff at that. They go, that couldn't have happened. I, like, I'm going to believe that, right? Because in their scientific mind, that's impossible. Well, that's also why we call it a miracle, okay? But still, at the end of the day, we each have to decide whether we're going to believe it or not. So it has to start there. Romans 10.9 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's just that simple. It's deciding that I believe Jesus is who he's been presented to be, that he is the Savior of the world. He is the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. Paul goes on and says, for it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Amen, right? You know, we often know as, as our relationship is built, uh, mine and my wife's relationship built, I had to spend time with you, with her, mm -hmm. the people that I care about, love, I have to spend time with them, first of all. So knowing Jesus can't really be much yeah, different. Yeah, because we, we can know of him. Right. It's just like we can know of the governor, but we don't know her. Mm -hmm. It's one of those one-on-one -on -one conversations that we have to have. You know, and our lives have to be um, in line. You know what I mean? We have to spend time in his word. If not, we don't know who he is. We need to search the scriptures. Yeah, we do need to say it. We need a prayer. We, we need to have prayer. And you know what, what I'm guilty of is it says pray without ceasing. We're supposed to be always in prayer praying for those things, talking with God like you and I. It doesn't have to be this crazy old prayer. It, it's just talking to God. And I think that's opened up my own life is prayer time, is telling my Lord my faults and when I'm scared and all of those things that he needs to hear as, as my father that has helped open up that time. That's and, a continual conversation yes. versus... Another thing is spending time with other believers. You know, uh, as I said on the front end, do we even need to come in church? Why can't we just talk? You know, it's a little bit more difficult when you don't have someone to sharpen you mm -hmm. and to be able to be on the same page. When you're at home, it's a little bit more difficult. In, in, in my own life, it is. I know. I've, I've read things, and then after I talked with other believers, realized that I had not completely understood what I had read. It's refining, so it, yeah. Yeah, it's a refining. A refining of the understanding of what God's Scripture has to say to us individually and as a whole. But that leads us to our second part in Romans, Romans uh, four, 10, verse 14, uh, where Paul is saying, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. You know, how about that second part of that statement? To make him known. How do we practically do that? To make him known. Well, I, I think is the essence of what it says here is that once we've received that good news, are we going to hoard it you know, for ourselves and just keep it to ourselves? Are we going to go out from here and make him known? 
One of my favorite passages is out of Acts, and it's when Jesus was right before he was ascending, and he gathered his disciples together, and he told them very simply, he says, you will be my witnesses. And I'm not sure how often you think about this, but I think about it often that I'm thankful his disciples obeyed his command. Because let's be real for a minute. If they had not, would we even be talking to each other? We might not even know each other, right? We would not be saved. We would not know the good news because they just decided to keep it to themselves. And then when they died, the message died off, right? But it's because of faithful witnesses that that message is spread across the entire globe. And throughout the last couple thousand years, many have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, don't miss the word that Jesus gave them. Because he told them just simply to be witnesses. When I think about what a witness is, I think about a court case. I don't know if you've ever been called into court as a witness. But as a witness, your job is not to convince the judge or the jury. Your job is simply what? Testify. To tell them what you know, what you've experienced, what they do, the judge or the jury with that, that's their business. And that's true of us as we go out and make him known. All we can do is witness to them. We're not called to convert them. We're called to witness to them. Do you see the difference? What they do with the information is between them and God. You know, Paul in one of his writings says, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was... God who brought the increase. We just simply have to be faithful to do our part and to witness, to go out there and share what he's done. You know, <clears throat> another way we can testify is, you know, this morning we need to realize who we're serving, first and foremost. You know, we don't serve a past tense God. He's alive and active and Amen. is willing to work and change us daily if we are saying, here I am, Lord, change right. me, move me. You know, that's first of all. We can testify also, secondly, with our lives. Using our own testimonies. Not this theological thing that we come up with and saying, you know, all of this pieces. In my own life, I was once blind. And now I can see. That's simple. I once lived like this. And now I live like this. I don't know why, but Jesus changed me. You know, it reminds me of that story in the New Testament where Jesus actually healed somebody that was blind. He was brought in to testify before the religious leaders. And they said, we don't believe you. And he says, whether you believe it or not, I don't care. All I know is I was blind, but now I can see. What you do with that, that's on you, okay? Yeah, it's how many of us were blind at one time and now we can see. It's up to us to share that knowledge with other people. So they can see clearly as well, and then they can testify to what he's done. That's why I think what Jesus said about your approval means nothing to me is a good word for many of us to hear. Because let's be honest with ourselves. The reason that many of us don't witness as often as maybe we did when we first came to the Lord is because we're concerned about how people are going to receive it. And we know the world generally today is not super receptive of the gospel message. But let's be less concerned about their approval and more concerned about doing what Jesus told us to do, to simply be his witnesses. Yeah, that uh, fear of man can be fear sometimes, but would you rather fear man or fear Almighty God? That's the That's pretty easy, picture really. that we have to look <laughs> at, and we just need to follow that. Another way is we need to live differently. Mm -hmm. If Christ is living within us, we ought to be different. We ought to, uh, you know, smell, I would say, like Jesus if we're in that place. Uh, a, a good example of that is Paul in Philippians 3.17 tells us, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. You know, as Paul encouraged these people to pattern their lives after him, he was seeking and pursuing the Messiah. Jesus, and he wanted them to do the same. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, this morning, each one of you. As Paul said these words to pattern their lives after his, if, what kind of follower would a new Christian become if he or she patterned your life this morning? 
That's a, that's a pretty tough question for some of us, isn't it? You know, if there was an honest evaluation. I, I was reminded of something a guy brought up in one of our life groups the other night. He said, uh, and I've heard the phrase before, it's kind of debated who said it, but uh, the old idea, preach Christ daily and when necessary use words. Exactly. And it was the idea that it's how we live our life. It's the fact that we do take time to minister to the poor. It is that we take time to minister to those that are sick, that are imprisoned. But we do that because we want them to come to know Jesus too. Because he's the one that's going to change their life and change their condition. At best, all we can do is give a temporary fix to that. But he gives a permanent you know, fix to that. Let me ask you this, Helen. Is it too late? Is what do you guys think? Let me, to... Let's ask them. Is it too late to change? It's never too late. I mean, for some of us, what we need to do is we need to make a decision if we're going to put our faith and trust in Jesus or not. If we're going to believe the witnesses about him or not. That's up to you to decide. If you need more information, believe me, I'm here. I'll be happy to sit and talk with you about it, as would Leonard or others, Right? But for the rest of us, we need to say, hey, we're gathering together on a weekly basis, most of us, so that we can better know Jesus, but not to let it stop there, because it's not about us. It's about him. And what he wants us to do is he wants us to go out and make him known. And I think a lot of us have not really fulfilled that part of the mission that God's given us. Think about this week. How can my life better reflect who Jesus is in it? I don't think you have to carry a sign that says repent or die or, or anything like that. I think you just have to be the kind of person that people go, you're different. You're honest. You're dependable. You're a person who cares and genuinely loves other people. Why is that? It's because of Jesus. He changed me. Have you met him? Because that's what he wants us to do, to introduce him, right? Amen? Would you stand? We're entering in now to uh, our time of communion, and uh, let me first of all ask, would it, would it help, Kay, if we brought communion back to you so you didn't have to come forward? Okay, so just, just stay where you're at when we get ready for that. Anybody else that needs help? Okay, but um, Gary, would you mind doing that? But I wanted to let you know that uh, when we do communion together, there's a few things that we want everybody to know. First of all, it's a reminder to us of what Jesus was willing to do for us that he was willing to take our bad behavior, our disrespect and dishonor of God, and go to the cross to pay the penalty for that. And so when we take the cup and we take the bread, it's a reminder of the blood that was shed, a reminder of how his body was crucified. I'm not sure how meaningful that is to you, but I know how meaningful it is to me. As Leonard and I have both said, it changed our life, and it is our hope that it's changed yours as well. Communion at our church is open to anybody who sees Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so even if you're not a member of this church, that's perfectly fine. We want to encourage you to come and receive and celebrate the Lord's Supper. When you receive it today, we're going to ask you a simple question. Do you know Jesus? Because that's really what it's about. That's why we're taking communion, because you know him. And then we're going to encourage you to celebrate that supper together with us. But let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come and I'm thankful first and foremost for that privilege. And I'm thankful, Jesus, that you were willing to see the need we had long before we ever could. And even as it was revealed through the law and the prophets, there was a message that was being written out all those many years ago. And the message was about God's love manifested in the name Jesus and the very person of who Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. And Jesus, as we celebrate what you did for us, we first and foremost, Jesus, say thank you. I thank you that you changed my life. I thank you that you took my punishment so I didn't have to. I thank you because I see the message. I see that you are the key to eternal life, that I have the promise that when I leave this life, I will go to be in that place of perfect paradise that you've long ago created for us. It is that hope that seems so far in distance at time, Lord, that I cling to in the midst of the wicked days that are upon us. But Lord, as we celebrate, we recognize that all of that is going to be made whole 
because of this person named Jesus. Lord, it's my hope that someone who doesn't know that yet today, that today would be the day. And even if they have to come forward and say, I, I want to know Jesus, I'm not sure that I do know him, that today would be the day that they would come to know him as their Lord and their Savior. Jesus, we honor you in taking this communion together, and we do it in your name. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.